it was not too terribly long ago I did a wedding uh, for a couple, and their reception was down at the Clay County Fairgrounds. A number of you were at the wedding, you were at the reception, and um, at the reception, um, about part way through the evening, uh, I was getting pretty thirsty, and I'm not a big punch fan. And so I decided I was going to go. There was a a bar over in the corner. I decided I was going to go over there and get some drinks. And I thought, you know, I'll surprise my wife. I kind of excused myself, got up from our table, went over, kind of. It's one of those you weave your way through the crowd and all the tables. Excuse me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. And I get to the other side of the room, and I I order the drinks, and he gives me drinks, and then it's all the way back. Excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me. Whoops, almost spilled that on you. You get all the way back to our table, And as I sat down at our table, I noticed that everybody had stopped. It's like somebody had hit pause on life around our table. And as I sat down and I set the drinks on the table and looked at everybody, my wife looked at me, and in kind of a confused voice, she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting down. She said, no, what are those? I said, they're drinks. She said, what is that? And she points to a dark liquid in a a small, clear plastic cup. And I said, that's a Coke for you because I thought you'd be thirsty. And she goes, okay, but what's that? And she points to the other plastic cup and through it you can see a yellowish liquid that has foam on the top. And I looked at it and I said, well, that's my Mountain Dew. And it was a little warm and it foamed up and it really does not taste that good. Yeah, that's what everybody else at the table did, too. Well, the preacher's not going to hell now. (laughs) She said, you know, it probably wouldn't look so bad if you didn't have a beer logo on your cup. And I'm like, what? They're clear plastic cups. Somebody at the table said, look at the other side. I turned them around. Big emblem on the front, Michelob Light. (laughs) And I just traversed the whole building. Excuse me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. (sighs) You know, um, to make matters worse that evening, um, I do not like, I'm one of those people that does not like to dance. And when you go to a wedding reception, they almost always have dances. And I don't like to dance because partly, you know, I wake up the next day and find that my mind's written checks my body couldn't cash, and I'm sore. And I partly don't like to dance because I just look ridiculous. I mean, I'm like a camel on ice skates having a seizure. It's really, (laughs) it's not a pretty sight. But in, in God's infinite sense of humor, I married a lady who loves to dance. And we go to weddings, and we're at these receptions. She's like, you want to dance? Uh, yes, dear. And we'll slow dance. And as soon as the pass song comes on, I'm off the floor. Well, in this particular evening, you know, I don't know if the love was in the air. It's because I had a couple Mountain Dews under my belt. But I was, <laughs> I was starting to feel like, you know what? I just I want to show my wife love, and I'm going to do something that I absolutely do not want to do. And so uh, a song came out and said, hey, let's go dance. And we went and we slow danced to a song. And the next song was fast. And she turned to leave the floor because that is, she knows that's way out of my comfort zone. I said, no, why don't we stay here and dance? She goes, you know this is a fast song, don't you? (laughs) I'm like, yeah, let's dance. And so we danced through that song. and, and, And we danced through the next song. And we danced through three or four songs. And I'm starting to get a little more comfortable as we dance because I decide, you know, I just don't care what other people think now. You know, I don't care, and, and nobody's called 911 thinking I'm having a seizure, so I'm just going to keep dancing. And, and we did, and we had fun that evening, but the next day, that was on Saturday, next day we got to church, and one of you came up to me, and you were laughing before church started, and I said, what, what, what's so funny? And you said, well, last night at the reception. I said, yeah. He goes, one of my friends came up to me at the end of the evening, and they said, man, you're, you're a preacher. I didn't know he drank. And my friend goes, I don't think he does. And he goes, no, no, he did. I saw him carrying some beers through the, and a little bit later, he was out on the dance floor all loosened up. (laughs) And I thought, oh, you know, I, I, I'm one of those people, if you've ever watched the um, sporting events, they have a dance cam and I don't, 
I don't want to be one of those people on the screen. I'm kind of more reserved, sit back. Honestly, truth be known, um, <laughs> as, as foolish as my life seems at times, I don't want to be a fool. I'm worried about what they think. And, and, and I look at the um, complexity of marriage and how God brings two different people together. And I look at my wife and I see somebody who does not care what people think. And if that, if that dance cam jumbotron was on, she'd be right up there with everybody else dancing. Well, I would try and lean off of the screen and say, good job, honey, good job. I don't want to be a fool. And I think that there are a lot of us, a lot of us following Christ today that we have that same feeling in the back of our minds. I don't want to be a fool. I don't, I don't want to be a fool dancing. I don't want to be a fool. I just don't want to, I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to look like an idiot. But, you know, if, if, if we continue on this thought of dancing and looking like an idiot, we find that there are other people who've been there. They've danced, and they didn't care what the world thought. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6 today, I want to look at that. We've been going through this series on worship, and I want to look at a passage here in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I tell you what... Um, I couldn't read my Bible before because the print was too small, so I got reading glasses. And then I got smart, and I went and got a Bible with large print. And I tried that last week, and I still need my reading glasses. <laughs> See, that's what happens if you drink too many Mountain Dews. Um, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, something really cool happens here. And we read in verse 16, and after we read this, I'll go back and, and talk a little bit about kind of some of the backstory on it. It says, but as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. Now, we're talking about King David, and we're talking about his wife, Michael. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the special tent that David had prepared. And, and David sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. And he goes on and, and he blesses the people and he gives them uh, a lot of gifts. And in verse 20, when David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. Now, guys, you don't have to be married very long to know if you haven't even got in the door and your wife's coming out, there's trouble at home. She comes out to meet him, and she says this. In disgust, she said, How distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to servant girls like any vulgar person might do. Now, just for clarification here, David wasn't dancing down the street naked. He had on his linen ephod. One of, one of uh, my friends was asking me, he said, what's the sermon on this week? And I was telling him, and I said, you know what, David danced. We always say David danced naked before the Lord. He said, oh, please tell me you're not going to do that in front of church. <laughs> <laughs> no. David dances, and, and she gets on him about it. And in verse 21, he says, I was dancing before the Lord. Now, look at what she's doing. She says, look at how you acted in front of all of these people. And David's response is, people? I wasn't doing it for all the people. This is not about the people. This is about me and God. This was a me and God time, a me and God experience. And he goes on, and um, he uses a phrase that probably um, started a heck of an argument where he says, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all of his family. He's talking about kingship there. He appointed me as leader of Israel and the people of the Lord, or of the people of the Lord. So I celebrated before the Lord. Yes, I'm willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I'm distinguished. And it goes on to talk about Paul's, or God's judgment on Saul's daughter, Michael. And as I look at that, I, I, I think, you know, is this a sermon on dancing? No. This is, this is a message on us living so much in the presence of God like King David. A king that was after God's own heart, Scripture calls him. That you and I don't see all the people. 
that like David, we're so caught up in God's presence. It doesn't mean that we, 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 we just walk around in a trance all the time, but we're so aware of the presence of God in each and every aspect of our lives that when someone goes, I can't believe you did that, our response would be, why would I not do that? I was honoring God. You see, we've talked how worship is so much more than um, singing songs. It's so much more than just the hour on Sunday morning. Worship is the time where we kiss toward the hand of God is literally what it means as, as we are subject to him as he is so much greater than us that we would kiss towards his hand showing reverence, respect, awe. We talked last week about how obedience is a part of that. That we might dance before the Lord, figuratively speaking, in such a way that shows this life is not about me and this life is not about everybody else watching me. It's about me and my relationship with God. You know, the interesting thing is if you look at David as a king, dancing like that in public was not something that a king would do. He was to be regal. He was to be dignified. He was to keep it all together. But David was just, he was so excited, he was undone, he couldn't contain himself. And if we go back and we look just a couple verses earlier, he's wearing all of his priestly garb. And I'm imagining, culturally speaking, it was an outward expression of what they felt inside, that they would dance, that they would celebrate. They were very active people and, and very musical people. And as, as they're going through the streets of Jerusalem and they're finally bringing the ark home, David can't contain himself. Now, you see, the Ark of the Covenant was an ornate a box or, or chest that was overlaid with gold and, and the priest, the high priest, clear back in Exodus, God had them design this box and he gave them specific instructions and the high priest or the priest carried this box on long poles. People could not touch the box. As a matter of fact, you go back earlier in this very chapter and you find a man with good intentions touches, touches the Ark of the Covenant and God strikes him dead. God's serious about it. Don't touch this box. And it was about... A, 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 and appreciation of the respect, reverence, and awe of who God was because God said, I want you to make this box as a reminder that I am your God and I am with you. And they put this, this Ark of the Covenant, they put it in, in a special place called the tabernacle as they wandered through the wilderness and before the temple was built. And God's, God's presence would dwell amongst his people in that or on that Ark of the Covenant. It was a very a special symbol of the relationship that God had with his people. But somewhere along the line, they had lost sight of that. And somewhere along the line, they began to look at the Ark of the Covenant as, as the magical box. Because many times God would have them carry the Ark of the Covenant ahead of you. Carry the Ark of the Covenant into battle. Carry the Ark of the Covenant here. And they would see victories and they'd see God do incredible things. And so they get to this one point where they're, they're viewing it as the Ark of the Covenant is this magical box that helps us win victories. And they carry it into battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines not only defeat them, but take the Ark of the Covenant. And, and we won't belabor the point to go through all the circumstances that God brings about, but the Ark of the Covenant comes back to Israel. And when it gets back to Israel, this is David celebrating because symbolically this is the presence they feel, or the, 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 symbolically this is God's return, his presence returning to his people. And so he is so excited. We're be, we've been restored. A man after God's own heart says our nation has been restored in our relationship with God, and he cannot contain himself. So I imagine as he's dancing in the hot, dusty summer heat down the main street of Jerusalem with crowds pressing in on every side, he's starting to get hot, and he takes off his, his priestly or his kingly garments, his outer robes, and he lays them to the side, and, and he takes off another lane, takes off. He's down to his undergarments. So now not only is the king not acting dignified, he's not even dressed in a dignified way, and he's wearing clothes that a commoner might wear when they're doing menial and manual labor in the heat of the day, stripped down to nothing but his shorts. And here his wife sees him, and she goes, what a joke you are. You look like such a fool out there. You know, I, I, I used to be married to the king. Now I'm married to the court jester. I didn't sign up for this. 
And, and she's so frustrated and disgusted and discouraged at the, the whole scene that has unfolded. She wants nothing to do with David. David didn't have a care in the world of how he was perceived. And I wonder how many times are we like David or how many times maybe you're more like me and we're like Michael, David's wife. Where we hold back, where we sit back, where we stand back and we go, <laughs> not me, not me. That's out of my comfort zone. I, I, I'd be embarrassed. Do you know what people might say? I talk to people at times who, in their, in their job, um, they, they're concerned. They say, you know, you don't understand. I can't, just, I can't just openly worship God. You know what happened if I walk through the middle of my job dancing and singing and pulling my clothes off? That's not what we're talking about. Please don't leave here today and do that. David's expression of worship is what I, I, I want us to key on the heart of worship, not the expression of worship. And, and I wonder if you and I would have the same heart of worship that David had, that we don't care what everybody else thinks, that I'm going to, remember we said worship is kissing toward the hand, and last week we talked about how that's done in spirit and in truth. It's not just an outward act, it's also something that wells up from in our heart, from, from our love and passion for God. And the truth part of that is, God's truth, His word, is He's revealed Himself and His expectations of us. So am I going to be obedient to him and live a life of obedience to him regardless of what other people say? Will I be obedient even when I look like a fool? Will I be obedient even when it costs me the respect of someone I love? Will, will, will I be obedient when it costs me friendships or finances? We don't want to look like the fool on the screen of our community. We don't want to look like the fool on the, on the screen of our, our, our neighborhood. We don't want to look like a fool in our families. And so maybe like Michael, we recoil and we say, that ain't for me. Are you like David or are you like Michael? Jesus says something pretty um, direct. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says this. He's talking to his disciples. He predicts his death. He says, if any of you want to be my followers, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, that's probably a verse uh, a number of us may be familiar with. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Now, he's not talking about how we so glibly sometimes say, well, I'm just suffering for Jesus. This is my cross to bear. You know, your cross to bear for Jesus is not your in-laws. You know, your cross to bear for Jesus is not a miserable job. Your cross, to bear, your cross and my cross to bear for Jesus is obedience to him, whatever the cost. Because he goes on to say there after verse 23, he says, look, if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you'll give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. If you try to call the shots in your life, if you try to protect your own dignity and make sure you look good and you've got it all together and people aren't making fun of you and pointing and whispering and laughing and going, that idiot. They, they really think that following a book of ancient sayings is going to make a difference in their life. Just said, you want to hang on to it, go ahead, but I'll tell you right now, you're going to lose it. You aren't strong enough to hang on to it. You aren't powerful enough to control everything. But he said, if you recognize that you're not in control, if you recognize that I have the wisdom and the authority and you're willing to surrender your life to me, he said, let me tell you what, you, you're going to gain. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost and destroyed? He's, he's saying this, Mark, or Luke chapter 9, verse 25. And here's verse 26. It's, it's the punch of what I want to get to. If anyone's ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father 
and the holy angels. I hear sometimes in churches when people say, well, why didn't so-and-so get baptized on Sunday morning? I said, well, they, they, they're very uncomfortable being in front of large groups. And so they have family and friends in, and it was a nice, quaint, uh, close-knit setting. And I've heard people before say, well, if they're ashamed of Jesus before men, then Jesus, that's not what that verse is talking about. Isn't, I, I, think, I think a lot of us are just like me. We want to stand on our side of the fence and lob stones over at the people who feel different, who, who, who are different. It just because someone can't stand in front of a group of 200 people, that many of which, 99%, they don't know, doesn't mean that they're ashamed of Jesus. It means they're freaked out about standing in front of people. And, and, and I've met over my lifetime people who have no qualms about standing in front of 200 or 2,000 people and pouring their whole life out and saying, I love Jesus, and then go to work the next day and live for the next five days like they never met him. Because, man, I don't want to look like a Bible thumper. You don't have to be abusive. Just love Jesus. Isn't it? I, I, well, I don't know why it's so hard for us to grasp in our life sometimes. That, you know what? Because I love my wife, there are things that I will do for her, and there are things that I will not or would never do. Because I love her. And I, I don't have to go around shoving that down people's throat. I don't have to go around saying, my wife's better than your wife. It's in the context of a relationship, and people who know you and know me should know pretty darn quick whether we love our spouse or not. People who know you and know me should know pretty darn quick whether we love our Lord or not. Not because I'm carrying a 10-pound Bible into work, slapping it on the table and reading it at lunch. But in all of the subtle ways, they see you and I are different. In the, in the little ways that, that you really have to watch to notice. Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, if you're too embarrassed, if you're going to pull back and recoil and go, I'm not going to do that. I'll look like a fool. I'm not going to do that. That's going to cost me. I'm not going to. Jesus, I love you. I do. But look, here in America, I don't think you understand, God. We got this thing called separation of separation of state and church. <laughs> we can't be mixing that up now. I wonder how many times Jesus looks at us and says, You realize who I am? Ashamed. I'm not ashamed of Jesus, ashamed. It's not me, ashamed. If you're ashamed, he says, if we are embarrassed, if we are fearful of ridicule because of our actions or our beliefs, that what that, that's what that word means. If we're going to close up, clam up, and quiet down when we know we should speak, if we don't act when we know that we should act, or, or in the presence of others we we act in a way that we know we shouldn't act because of that fear of recoil, that fear of ridicule, that embarrassment. I don't want to be different or look different. So I'm just going to sit over here in the corner and quietly do my job. She says, if you're ashamed of me, what do you say there in the end of the verse? The son of man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory. When we shrink back instead of taking a stand for Christ and confidently living out our love for him, when we show shame of his principles and shame for his expectations and shame of his commands and shame of who he is and shame of everything he stands for, and we can say, I'm not ashamed. But if we are not living that out, we've got to ask ourselves, then what am I? Because Scripture would define it as shame. You don't understand, I'll lose my job. 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 through down through the 20s is a pretty amazing chapter. And it talks about people. We look at it and we see it as the, the heroes of faith. And we say, oh, here are all these great people that did these incredible things for God. You know, this guy Enoch, he lived differently than everybody else around him. He lived for 365 years and he didn't die. God took him to heaven. There's, there's these people we read about that lived lives. They were so in love with God that we call them heroes of the faith. And I think many times it's a terrible title because we disconnect from that. And we say, that's for the super spiritual. That's not for me. We hear the account of Noah in Scripture. Noah who built an ark for 100 years and was faced with ridicule every day. And we think, well, that's the super spiritual Noah. That's not me. Or we hear the story, the account of Abraham in Genesis where he left everything he knew and he moved to a place that he didn't know. Well, that's, that's Abraham. He's the father of faith. That's, that's not me. And we look at all these guys and we disconnect from them saying they're the heroes and I'm just a normal Joe. But guess what? The hero was before he was a hero. There's normal Joe like me and you. And the only difference is they made different choices than you and I make. And incredible things happened in their life, not because Noah was an incredible person, but because he was incredibly in love with God. Not because Abraham was some stoic, super religious guy that was out of touch with the rest of the world or that he lived in a time that was easier to live for God. Not at all. But he was average Joe that made different decisions than you and I make. And he didn't care what the world thought. And you go on down through Hebrews chapter 11 and you'll find people who were thrown into pits with lions. They were dropped into fiery furnaces. They were physically beaten with whips. They were chained in prison. They were sawn in half. They had mobs of people hurl rocks of all different sizes and shapes at them until they were dead. They had no clothes. They lived in caves, all because they worshiped God. All because they chose to kiss towards his hand, regardless of the cost. They respected him, they revered him, they served him, they obeyed him, not just with their lips, but with their heart as well. And they didn't care what it cost. They didn't just come together on a Sunday for an hour and say, God, I really love you. They lived in his presence each and every day. And because they did, God did incredible things through their lives. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 38, I love this phrase after it describes everything they went through because they were not ashamed. It says the world was not worthy of them. As I look at my life and at your life, I wonder, would God look at the way we live out our faith and the way that we worship him, the way that we bow and we kiss towards his hand in reverence and respect and awe and the way that we live obedient lives because we're worshiping in spirit, in, in heart, not just man-made religion. We're worshiping in spirit, but we're also worshiping in obedient truth. Would God look at us at the end of the run and say, the world wasn't worthy of you either. I want us to do something right now that we are not very good at. It's not dancing. I want us, I want us to sing a song. In the men's group, if you're here on a Sunday night, you're familiar with this song. It's a song called Sing Alleluia to the Lord. And I want us to sing it. I want us to sing it to God. I want us to worship him. Alleluia is a, is, a, is a term of endearment. It's an expression of reverence and awe. It's, it's a worshipful phrase that we're going to use. Sing Alleluia to the Lord. And that men, I know you're really not going to like this, and that's okay. I don't care. <laughs> Please stand up, men. We're going to start this song. And it's pretty easy. If you know it, sing out. And if we're not singing out as men, we're going to start over because... 
We don't have men's group till 6.30 tonight, so we got lots of time. I, w- I, want us to, I want us to sing this chorus. And the reason I'm having you stand up as men, because as I read scripture, God's placed on you the mantle. And the responsibility of being the heads of your home. And leaders in the world. And leaders in the church. You're the priests of your family and you represent them before God. And that's the God we stand before today. Sing this song with me if you would. Sing alleluia to the Lord. 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 Jesus is risen from the dead. Take a minute and talk with God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. God, you didn't hesitate for a moment. For your son to experience the humiliation, the pain, and the shame that he bore on the cross. God, you ask nothing less from us in return that we would be willing to humble ourselves, that we would be willing to be different at any cost, that we would live a life of obedience to you, and that we share your love with the world. God, help us learn to to worship you, not just here where it's safe and comfortable and we all think the same, but God, help us to worship you outside of these walls, that we would daily kiss toward your hand in a way that honors you in a way that you are so much more deserving of than we could ever express. Father, in a way that we don't care what the rest of the world thinks. It's in Jesus' name.